and thank you so much for inviting me to this very uh, important meeting. Um, I will say, though, at, at the outset, I think everybody has made some comment about their views and so forth. Uh, I, let's just say that I'm very glad that the final version of the agenda turned out to be what it did versus the very first one I got, because I think we will get a much broader perspective on this very important issue. So I work for the government, so I have to uh, say this. And this is an unusual talk because I'm kind of told you have to talk about this. So I'm going to tell you what I was told I have to talk about. I have to talk about decision-making capacity and physician assist death. I'm not sure why I was picked to talk about this, but I am asked to address the concept of the slippery slope as applied to the US. And I'm going to do that all the while kind of intersperse some comments on the evidence gaps. All right, so decision-making capacity <laughs> is a legal term in most modern laws. Uh, we often say in you know, clinical sense, competence, this capacity, but in fact, they're equivalent terms. What clinicians determine usually carries the day, um, except for unusual situations, then the, we have to go to the judge, and we would call that adjudicated competence or capacity. Um, Nowadays, we do this, do these assessment, assessments based on functional criteria, and I think Dr. Strauss will talk a little bit about this. I'm not going to belabor it. There's um, various criteria that people use, but states define their own what, what criteria should be used. We, there is a literature on what's most commonly used, and I just listed them there. And they're supposed to be decision specific, so you can't just be labeled as incompetent and they deprive everything. Uh, in, in this context. This is really about specific decisions. And every adult has a presumption that he or she is competent. However, but if there is good reason to do an assessment, because let's say you know the person has dementia that's fairly uh, progressed, then that presumption doesn't exist. And it takes into account the context of the decision. And this is where it gets rather tricky, because we want clinicians and judges take into account how serious a decision is to try to figure out how you know, rigorously you evaluate and the thresholds and so forth that are used. OK. So main things I want to say about this are the topics. Is it easy to do, assess folks for decision-making capacity or not? I want to say one thing about that. How common is it that people actually have impaired capacity toward the end of life? How reliable? So in a technical sense, when doctors talk about reliability, what they mean is when at different time points, is it the same uh, judgment? Or when different people do the same assessment of the same patient at the same time, they should agree, right? So it's kind of an agreement issue. I, I will say that we have very little direct systematic, that's the key word here, systematic data on decision-making capacity for PAD. I, it's very difficult to find. I, I think I, there might be a couple. Um, you have, we're at, still at the stage where we have case series, your case descriptions of capacity in patients. OK. So here's a statement. Competency is easily determined by the patient's doctor. Very definitive, straightforward comment. Guess who made this, uh, this definitive statement? This isn't a court ruling by Judge Dorothy McCarter in the context of the uh, Baxter v. Montana, which is, uh, this was at, at a lower level. This eventually went to the state Supreme Court. So she's very confident. And actually, in some cases, it's quite easy. So in, when you think about those cases, I think this is a fair statement. I got a quote from another uh, ju judge. This is Justice Butler Shaw, who is a well-known uh, judge in England. And she says the general law of mental capacity is clear and easily to be understood by lawyers. <laughs> However, she says, its application to individual cases is infinitely more difficult to achieve, having seen a lot of these cases come to court. So who's right? Well, in a way, both. And I'm going to try to explain. It's a tough task that we're, t we're asked to do, right? Because there is the legal construct. But Unfortunately, nature doesn't cooperate with our you know, legal categories and so forth. So the clinical reality is something that has to be put into this legal construct. 
So I decided to, since we're talking about Oregon, here, this is from the Oregon uh, statutes. This is what they mean by decision-making incapacity. And it says, inca incapable means basically you lack the ability to make and communicate decisions. So it's nearly tautologous, right? Incapacity means you're incapable. And it doesn't guide doctors and judges all that much. Now, not all states are like this, of course. Now, wh what do psychiatrists think about these, doing these assessments? Um, Linda has done really the you know, uh, bulk of the work on this and uh, in this topic. And I just quote a couple of her studies in which basically psychiatrists uh, and forensic psychiatrists aren't as confident, let's say, about their ability to evaluate a patient and say, yes, whatever. Now, I also uh, quote a survey we did of CL psychiatrists, um, consultation psychiatrists, who are primarily the group that would do these kind of evaluation hospitals anyway. And clear majority of them find these to be more challenging than typical consultations they do. Decision-making capacity impairment is very common at the end of life. Um, my colleagues and I published a paper in which um, this was well documented. In one study, nearly half of the elderly terminally ill cancer patients failed on a measure of capacity. And I just wanted to cite that study because what they found is that without a thorough evaluation, doctors may fail to recognize this even when the impairment is pronounced. And as a, as a kind of reinforcing uh, evidence for that, when I was in medical school, I won't tell you, let's say back in the 80s sometime, um, we, were, we, we were told that ALS is a disease of the motor system. In fact, in England, they still call it motor neuron disease. But since then, there's lots of research that's shown that half the people, up to half the people, have significant cognitive impairment. So it's the kind of thing where you would need to have more than a conversation, obviously, to assess their capacity. Um, now, undetected cognitive impairment is very common in hospice patients. This is a study that's significant because it was done by probably leading decision-making capacity researchers in geriatric psychiatry group uh, uh, with Dilip Jesti and UCSD. And this design was interesting because they made sure to get both inpatients and outpatients. And it turned out to be white, educated, elderly uh, folks, not, I mean, kind of not unrecognizable group of people, I should say. And what they did was they specially selected for no documented or clinically obvious impairment or disorders. So they targeted people that you would kind of presume to be competent, in other words. And what they found was that 54% had significant cognitive impairment. Um, that is, they had multiple domains that were uh, affected. And they did significantly worse on the particular decision-making capacity measure they chose to use in that study. All right. This is one of the few studies that actually looked at people who requested assisted death. Uh, this is uh, quite old, 17 years, in, in the Netherlands. They looked at 22 people who requested, and they found that five people had decreased competence. And in two of five cases, they note that the primary doctors thought the patients were actually competent and would have assisted that if they hadn't done the study and have measured uh, capacity in this setting. So there isn't a whole lot of, this is not large data, you, might, you could say, in that sense. Okay, how reliable are these? As I said, it could be really reliable if the patient sample has a bimodal distribution. So you can look at studies that say, oh, our doctors are really able to really precisely divide the groups into competent and incompetent. Well, it depends on your sample, right? If you have people who are very impaired and people who are not very impaired, then most people can separate that into two groups. Also, when the decision is familiar, and all the people doing the evaluations share the same training background, like psychiatry, and shared risk-benefit framework. So I gave you an example, a very good study done in England by Cairns, which had very high agreement among doctors. But then you could have really low agreement. Now, that occurs when evaluators are from different backgrounds. Um, and also, if you make sure to have a well-distributed sample, the middle of the sample will generate a lot more disagreement, as you might imagine, whereas the tails will be more reliably assessed. 
And then unsettled areas of decision making where people who did the assessments might not have shared views about, well, now what is this decision exactly like? This patient is being assessed to enter a research study and the research study involves X, Y, Z. You know, in those settings, I've done multiple studies in which you, you know, half the doctors say yes, half the doctors say no. I mean, you can get lots of variability. And I do know that there's known disagreement among doctors who do these assessments in the Netherlands when, you, when we've done case uh, studies that, you know, I wouldn't say it's a high number, maybe one in seven or eight cases of patients with psychiatric disorders, so you'd have to do these close capacity evaluations, presumably, and doctors disagree. So, who, so what do you do in that case? Okay. So that's my decision-making capacity part of the talk. Now I'm going to talk about this concept of slippery slope. Um, it refers to usually undesired expansion of PAD. So there's two types of expansion. We've already referred to them already. Expansion within practices and then expansion of practice categories, what people have called logical or conceptual slippery slope. Now, in order to assess these, at least for part, many of these expansions, we do need more data. And I would say that, you know, it's a very important question. I'm going to comment on that in a little bit, that we, we need data to understand it. Now, this is really important to have good data because the decision and the procedure is pretty final. You know, there isn't, you know, if doctors cut off the wrong leg, there is some repercussions, you might say. When a person dies, it's very difficult, especially in cases where if the patient is not socially integrated and a lot of people aren't involved in that case. Okay, so um, this is in terms of application of laws. Decision-making capacity assessments. How do we know how strong a presumption of capacity is used? We don't really know. Thresholds, this is very analogous to what Dr. Lin just talked about, except for capacity. What kind of thresholds are being used? Do people just use kind of checklist? Yeah, he said this, she said that. Or is it an in-depth clinical interview really probing the person's understanding? Is it a standalone community consultant who, may, who is just asked to do this? Or is this assessment part of a system of many people involved in which there's a lot more accountability and transparency involved? Also, unless the system is in place, I think this is fair to say, there is a natural flow of referrals to low threshold evaluators, people who tend to say yes rather than no. Is that good or bad? How often does it happen? Those would seem to be good things to assess. Um, and I'm not going to belabor this point of terminal illness because I think Dr. Lin has talked about it better than I could. Just to say that I just want to call your attention to the fact that in Canada, the condition there is called reasonably foreseeable death. But some doctors are now interpreting that to mean as long as death is foreseeable within 10 years. So, it, you know, it's, there's a lot of flexibility. Okay. What are the gaps in evidence? Because PAD laws generally function to protect the doctors, okay? I don't mean that in the pejorative sense. These are laws to decriminalize what was once criminalized, right? So it's, in that context, it's, it's hard to write a law that creates a monitoring system that would measure systematically all the concerns that I, I, I'm raising, okay? Now, currently, monitoring is, I believe, the best in the Netherlands. They're the most transparent people. They publish summaries of cases. Um, so it's very useful. You can actually study and get a better sense of what it might look like when people die from euthanasia and assisted uh, suicide, which are the legal terms used. So I, I don't mean to offend anyone. Um, However, these are all still retrospective review of physician self-reports, and I would just refer you to a paper that uh, my fellow David Miller and I published in which we looked at all the cases that didn't meet criteria. Um, you'd be surprised to know, perhaps, or maybe not. Out of between the two countries since 2002, Belgium and Netherlands, some 60-some thousand cases of euthanasia and assisted death have occurred, uh, and only about Two doctors, I believe, have even been asked 
to refer to the prosecutor's office for um, um, further investigation out of those. So it's not a rigorous kind of thing you can do. Um, and large national studies, especially mostly Dutch, but some in Belgium too, are very informative actually. They're rigorously conducted, largely epidemiologic, so you can look at big trends. But generally, it doesn't give you a good flavor for what kind, what's the decision-making process that's occurring. And of course, I just wanted to note that in the US, a lot of the research that occurs in academic medical centers occur by NIH funding. And NIH is interested in diseases, disease silos, not um, you know, issues that cut across diseases. So it, it's very difficult to get funding to do this kind of research. OK, now the expansion of PAD categories. So there's a couple different types of expansions possible. One is expansion of categories of persons, <laughs> removal of the uh, terminal illness requirement, of course, would mean that you would have people who have disabilities or chronic mental illness or things like that. Children, um, which is legal in, um, uh, in the European countries, or I should say the Benelux countries. And then people who are decisionally incompetent at the time they receive uh, the, in this case, would be euthanasia. Um, expansion of practice, um, what I call PAD by appointment. So this is what occurs in Canada and European countries. You know, we've heard a lot of talk about today between physician assisted in terms of patient gets a prescription and ingests versus, versus that. That is kind of significant the way we do it in the US because it really puts the autonomy condition forefront for the patient. But if you have a PAD by appointment system, the difference is really, I believe, morally questionable that there is a really distinct difference. In fact, in Canada where you can do either, hospitals just decided, well, look, we're not going to do assisted what used to be assisted suicide or self-ingestion. We're only going to do injections. So I think that that issue is really uh, a significant one only if you implement it the way the US has. OK, so I'm just going to make two very brief comments about this. I'm just going to raise the question. The fragility of the terminal illness requirement, I think uh, David Orlicker referred to this issue of where do you draw the line. So what's interesting is in 2007, there was a New York Times Magazine article on this topic. And it quotes Booth Gardner, who was a two-term governor of Washington. And here he clearly states that uh, his goal is to you know, a strategic stepwise move to first get it for the terminal illness and then sway voters to really after majority of states are accepting it and the culture will shift and so forth. Now this, what's interesting, I'm, I point this out because this is not news obviously for many people who have been following this. Uh, this was kind of in the middle of the article in 2007. And so this is right after the California uh, legislation was uh, uh, past. And I, I was struck by the title of this article in a major news outlet, NPR, which says, despite sweeping aid and dying law, few will have that option. So it casts the issue in a different way. And you can read the quote, uh, which I won't go into. But I'm only pointing this out that I think there is a desire among many people who are very much for legal assisted dying of the kind that we have in Oregon and so forth. But it's, we need to realize that that constitutes about, I, back of the envelope calculation, maybe one in 12 cases of PAD that occur around the world. That is a small minority. And the movement that occurs, as I will try to explain, is pressure to change from terminal illness to unbearable suffering. And I'm not a lawyer, not a constitutional lawyer by any means. I don't know how it's going to happen. But let me just show you what typically sequence of events that happens when you change, when you remove terminal illness and replace it with unbearable suffering. What it does is it creates this odd situation that David uh, Orenlicker mentioned, which is it, it could, in theory, require intrusive quality life judgments by an MD because he has to decide, well, are you suffering enough? And somehow there's something really not quite right about having doctors have that kind of authority given by the state. 
So, in fact, in most states, jurisdictions, the way it happens is that to avoid this, most jurisdictions define unbearable suffering subjectively. So it becomes the patient gets to decide. Now, the implications of this are very important. One, in practice, it reduces to, and there's a constant social and cultural pressure to reduce it to, a mania autonomy-based justification, a very strong libertarian uh, practice. Second, which is what I call red flags become green flags phenomenon. So all the things that we've talked about when we talk about concerns, safeguards, what we need to be worried about in PAD were once thought to be the kind of things we need to see as red flags, now are framed as green flags because, for example, I'll give you an example. Mental illness is a red flag, as we heard today, in a terminal illness-based regime. But it becomes a green flag because having suffering from mental illness is now a necessary description and justification for PAD. The last thing I'll say is that since terminal illness no longer serves as a natural backstop, by that I mean, I'm, with my apologies to Dr. Lin, it, I think that we may not be able to predict precisely when people die, but the fact that people will die after having been diagnosed with a fatal terminal illness, there is an end. So doctors aren't so free to talk about, well, you know, what is futility, so forth, in that, in a, in that sense, because people pretty much know what incurable means in that context. Once you use unbearable suffering as the standard, then futility becomes much more tied to the social and health policy priorities that we're willing to devote to treatment of those disorders. And it becomes a, becomes a literally a trade-off in which, well, you know, we can't wait for utopia to provide best care for everybody, so we can't deny people this access. So it, it raises uh, interesting moral questions. And it's something to think about, because I don't believe that this terminal illness, illness condition is a, something that we can sort of completely assume to be a permanent fixture. It'll, it's it's, it's going to require some discussion, at least, I, I, I would suspect. And it's good to do it in the context of this, because it gives us an opportunity to think about, well, what kind of data are you going to collect and look at? Thank you.